All right, students, believe it or not, up to this point in our coverage of organic chemistry so far, I have taught you nearly all of the fundamental concepts you need to know in order to understand organic chemistry as a whole. There are a few more concepts that I'll need to introduce to you. Nevertheless, we have covered most of the basic founding principles. What does that mean? What is there left for us to do? The answer to that is learn reactions. Lots and lots of reactions. Before we get into that, however, I want to tell you guys a personal story. Many years ago, back when I was a freshman in college, I used to wear a different set of prescription glasses that had a slightly different shape. As weird as this sounds, they had a shape that was such that I could actually push them into my eye socket slightly and pull the top of my eyebrows over the top and front of my glass lenses. It kind of looked creepy, but a little bit funny. For some reason, I was an eccentric and crazy kid as a college freshman. When I attended my Philosophy 101 class, I used to sit front row and center with my eyebrows pulled over the front of my glasses. And I would stare at my instructor like this. never ever doing anything other than blinking and swallowing periodically. He was kind of one of those guys who paced back and forth as he lectured, so I would just follow him, looking at him like this, in astonishment with the flesh of my eyebrows pulled over the front of my lenses. I did this for several days spread over the course of the semester. I have no idea if it was actually as funny to him as it was to me, but I got a heck of a kick out of it. In this chapter, we're going to learn about various substitution reactions involving alcohols, ethers, epoxides, amines, and sulfur-containing compounds. After this lecture, you guys should know the reactants, reagents, products, and mechanisms of the following reactions. Adding HX to alcohols and ethers. Adding PBR3, PCL3, and SOCL2 to alcohols. Converting alcohols to sulfonate esters. Dehydrating alcohols oxidizing alcohols with PCC and dihydrogen chromate, as well as some other oxidizing agents I'll show you, substitution reactions of epoxides, substitution and elimination reactions of amines, and substitution reactions of thiols and sulfides. And note, we will skip section 10.10. .10. As I always do, each of these topics is covered in the respective sections of our text labeled here. So let's begin. This is the first reaction of the day, adding HX to alcohols, where X is either a chlorine, a bromine, or an iodine. Here's the basic idea. If you have an alcohol such as methanol shown here, an OH is generally speaking a pretty lousy leaving group. It's difficult for nucleophiles to come in here and kick off an OH unless they're really, really reactive nucleophiles. So what can we do if we want to kick off an OH? Well, the best way to do that is to protonate it. So if I react my alcohol with an acid like HBr, this could also be HCl or HI, what occurs is the oxygen's lone pair electrons come out and bond with the proton from the acid, kicking off a bromide. That gives me this intermediate. The oxygen, of course, still has a full octet. It just has a positive charge because it has three bonds. Now you should probably surmise that a positively charged oxygen, as shown here, is a very good leaving group compared to a neutral oxygen in an alcohol shown here. What happens next is because this H2O leaving group is such a good leaving group, bromide, Br-, and this could also be chloride or iodide, can come in here SN2 style, form a bond with this CH3, and kick off the water as a leaving group to give me this product, methyl bromide, or generically speaking, an alkyl halide, either an alkyl chloride, alkyl bromide, or alkyl iodide. Let's look at some specific examples. Draw the mechanism and identify the product of each reaction below. Here's the first one. I've got this molecule propanol reacting with hydroiodic acid. Now, I'm not going to actually draw the mechanism, but we'll try to ask you to imagine it in your mind. First thing that occurs is the lone pair electrons in the oxygen grab the hydrogen and form a bond with it to give me a positively charged protonated oxygen. Then the I- minus comes in as a nucleophile, forms a bond with the CH2, and kicks off the H2O leaving group in a single step, SN2 style, to give me this product, 1-iota propane. Here's another example. 
as before, the lone pairs on the oxygen come and form a bond with this hydrogen, kicking off the bromide, giving me a protonated H2O attached to this cyclohexane. In this case, that group could leave SN1 style or might be kicked off by a, an attacking bromide SN2 style. In either case, it gives me this product, cyclohexyl bromide. And here's one last example. I have my reacting OH get protonated by the hydrogen from the HBr to form an H2O leaving group. Positively charged oxygen leaves, giving me a tertiary carbocation, and then the Br- comes in SN1 style to give me the resulting product, shown here. This is what happens when I react an alcohol with HX, where HX is either HCl, HBr, or HI. Any questions? Good. It's the first reaction of the day. Let's take a look at the next one. What happens if I add HX to ethers? Well, you should remember that an ether is a group in which I've got an oxygen that's got two hydrocarbon chains on either side. These could be the same or different from each other. Very similar to what happens when I react an alcohol with HX, the lone pairs on the oxygen come out form a bond with this hydrogen and kick off the halide to give me a protonated oxygen intermediate. This yellow colored portion is of course an excellent leaving group, which means that this negatively charged halide, iodide in this case, can come in, form a bond with this carbon group and kick off this product alcohol in one step, SN2 style, giving me an alkyl halide. To help illustrate what's actually going on, I'm going to feed you this lecture problem. Draw the mechanism and identify the product of the reaction below. Take a look at this molecule. I've got an ether that is an oxygen bound to two different hydrocarbon groups. It is not symmetrical either, reacting with hydroiodic acid. As delineated before, what occurs is the lone pairs on the oxygen reach out and form a bond with this hydrogen, kicking off the iodide in the process to form a protonated oxygen intermediate. At this stage, the I- minus nucleophile could potentially attack the CH3 group to the left of the oxygen or the CH2 group to the right of the oxygen. Which of those do you think it will do? Well, as it turns out, because it's easier to attack a CH3 group than it is to attack a carbon that's bonded to another carbon, since the CH3 group is less sterically encroached by other groups around it, the I- minus will attack that. The reason for this is because this proceeds by an SN2 type mechanism. As it forms a bond with that carbon, it pushes these electrons off and into the oxygen, neutralizing its charge and giving us these products, methyl iodide and ethanol. Let's take a look at this example. I'm reacting this molecule with the same acid, hydroiodic acid. As before, the oxygen will reach out with its lone pair electrons and form a bond with that hydrogen, kicking off the iodide in the process to give me this protonated intermediate. You'll note that this oxygen is bonded to a tertiary carbon, which means that this intermediate will not undergo an SN2 mechanism. The reason is because this central carbon is flanked by three carbons. It's too encroached and thus too difficult for a nucleophile to come into this carbon and form a bond with it. Thus what occurs is this oxygen steals the two electrons it's sharing with this carbon and pulls them into itself to become neutralized, thereby releasing methanol, which I'm not showing here, and this tertiary carbocation. At this stage, the iodide nucleophile can now come in SN1 style and form a bond with that carbon to give me my final product, tert-butyl iodide. Thus, we can see that when an ether reacts with HX, either HCl, HBr, or HI, it can proceed by an SN1 or an SN2 mechanism, depending on the nature of the specific reactant in question. This brings us to our next reactions, adding PBr3, PCl3, or SOCL2 to alcohols. Now, I, I acknowledge that the two reactions I've shown you thus far, reacting an alcohol or an ether with HX does produce an alkyl halide, either an alkyl chloride, an alkyl bromide, or an alkyl iodide. However, there are better, much smoother, and more efficient ways of turning alcohols into alkyl chlorides and bromides. One of them is this. 
If I take an alcohol such as this cyclopentanol shown here and treat it with this reagent called thionyl chloride, which I often just call SOCL2, and usually I don't say SOCL2, I actually say SOCL2 like I'm howling at the moon because it makes it more exciting. What happens is this OH gets replaced with a chlorine, giving me an alkyl chloride. This is a very efficient way to convert an alcohol directly into an alkyl chloride. Similarly, you can treat an alcohol, such as this example molecule shown here, with this reagent, PBr3, and replace the OH with a bromine, giving us alkyl bromide. Now, one thing that I want to stress is this. PBr3 can be replaced with PCl3, phosphorus trichloride, if you want to replace the OH with a chlorine instead of a bromine. What's the take home from this slide? Well, if you want to convert an alcohol into an alkyl chloride, you can, instead of reacting with hydrochloric acid, react it with SOCL2 or PCl3. Similarly, if you want to convert an alcohol into an alkyl bromide, you can react it with PBr3. So here are the mechanisms of those reactions, which I do not require you to know and I'm not going to go through. I am going to show them to you just in case you want to look at them. In the case of PBr3, the alcohol's lone pair goes into the phosphorus, kicks off a bromide, and gives us this intermediate. This molecule right here, which is called pyridine, strips that proton to give me this intermediate, and then an attacking bromide displaces it to give me my final product. With SOCL2, which looks like this, the oxygen undergoes this type of reaction mechanism. Once again, pyridine, the six-membered ring that has a nitrogen, is involved. Now we move to our next reaction, converting alcohols to sulfonate esters. What is a sulfonate ester? Well, don't worry, I'll show you. Here's the overall reaction. If I've got an alcohol and I treat it with a molecule that looks like this. Now look at this molecule closely. This is a sulfur, double bonded to two oxygens, also single bonded to chlorine, and then some kind of hydrocarbon group. I also add pyridine as a base. It ends up replacing this hydrogen with this sulfur double bonded to the oxygens and single bonded to this alkyl group. I hope you can look at that closely and see what's actually happening. This type of product is called a sulfonate ester. Now I realize at this point you might be wondering why in the world would I ever want to make a sulfonate ester. Although I'm going to show that to you in greater detail later on, I will summarize it right now by just saying this. This reaction is useful because a sulfonate group is a much better leaving group than an OH. In other words, if I want to convert an OH into a better leaving group, I can react it with sulfonyl chloride. Once again, I'll show you a more specific example of this further on. Here's the mechanism of this transformation, which once again, I don't require you to know, but I'm going to show you just in case you are interested. The oxygen lone pair electrons come out, form a bond with the sulfur, kick off the chloride, and give me this intermediate. The pyridine base strips this proton and pumps these electrons into the positively charged oxygen to neutralize it, giving me my sulfonate ester product. One thing I want you to note about this slide is the following. This R prime group is drawn to be generic, but it actually can represent different groups and thus different types of sulfonate esters. Here are the three different kinds of sulfonate esters that we will care about in this class. If this R group is a benzene ring bonded to a methyl group, we call this paratoluene sulfonyl chloride, or sometimes just tosyl chloride, or TS chloride. This type of group in which the R prime is just a methyl is called methane sulfonyl chloride, or sometimes just mesyl chloride. And this last group in which my R prime is a trifluoromethyl group is called trifluoromethane sulfonyl chloride, or sometimes just trifluyl chloride. Once again, I don't care if you know the structures of these with too much detail. What I do care about is that you know why they're used, which I'll show you right now. Sulfonate esters, as I mentioned before, are good leaving groups, so they can easily do this. If I've got an oxygen that presumably was formerly an OH and has been converted into a sulfonate ester, it can easily be kicked off by a nucleophile that normally couldn't kick off an OH. This is one example of an S- minus coming in and kicking off this sulfonate group to form this product right here. Here's another example. I've got my sulfonate ester right here, in this case a tosylate group, and I've got a cyanide nucleophile coming in here 
to kick off this oxygen. I guarantee that if I tried to do either of these two reactions with just a regular OH as opposed to an OTS, it would be much more difficult and maybe wouldn't even go at all. That brings us to this example from my class problem set. Draw the products of each of the following reactions. Now in this case I've only shown one. I've got OH reacting with tosyl chloride and pyridine in step one, and then I'm treating it with cyanide nucleophile in step two. What in the world does this sequence do? Well remember, what occurs is this oxygen reacts with the tosyl chloride to replace the hydrogen with the tosyl group. In other words, I will have, after step one, an OTS here. An OTS is a very, very good leaving group. That means that in step two, the cyanide can come in here, the carbon minus forms a bond with this carbon right here, and kicks off the OTS in one fell swoop, SN2 style, to give me this product. You'll note that there is an inversion of stereochemistry right here, because the cyanide has to come in from the backside relative to where the OTS was. All right, we're going to end this lecture right here, but don't worry, we'll go on teaching you about more wonderful substitution and elimination reactions. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.